in the blast freezer. I've seen the blast freezers. See, now it was minus forty. We did um, yeah, that's a typical minus forty is a typical uh, temperature for food pack. That was at the duck farm when they when they yeah, that's where they after they package the ducklings up, they, they have throw to freeze them, it they there. They throw them in the fr yeah. blast freezer. I mean, it's, when they put them there, that's to bring down the temperature as fast yeah, as possible. 40, it's a blast chiller, really. Right, it's, they kill like 4,500 ducks a day. They should be proud. Yeah, that's a big farm, you know. Yeah, I, went, it's, it's, I went there once. Aquabon? The one in Aquabon? I don't know, it's off of Sunrise as we go. Oh, no, that's, uh, that's uh, Jergowitz. Yeah, Jergowitz, I don't know. Right, that, the that other was, one is in Aquabon. He's the biggest one. And who runs that? Um, the owner is Lloyd Corwin. Uh, but um, like I said, they've been around since like I think since 1912 or something like that. They started. Damn, we, that's a lot of ducks. We, <laughs> built, <laughs> we built the feather plant where they so that they could process the feathers. They, they, they used to the sell feathers. them. They used to sell them in barrels wet. Now we built the plant so they could wash them, dry them, bale them, and then sell them like that. Huh. All right, man. <laughs> I know no. the ducks, man. If if I go back a little bit here, just to think, you see this pressure up there? Yeah. That's in a vacuum, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Negative pressure, yeah. This is a reciprocating compressor. Can't run in a vacuum. We do not like to see any compressor run in a vacuum. The only compressor that you permit to run in a vacuum is, guess what? Mitchell. Scroll. Squirrel? Scroll? <laughs> oh, that is a squirrel. I'm like, what if? <laughs> <laughs> no, scroll is a positive. Scroll is a. These are positive displacement. Centrifugal. 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 Because sometimes the low side of the big chill systems are in a vacuum, right? Yes. All the time. All the time. Except if you have bees. Mm -hmm. All right? But that's the only negative displacement compressor. Centrifugal, because the <coughs> low side is always in a vacuum, and in some cases, even the high side is in a vacuum. Hmm. Right. So really and um, with a centrifugal chiller, the low side is in a vacuum, and the high side pressure does not <coughs> exceed um, five psi. Yeah. All right. That's maximum operating pressure on the high side is permitted. <coughs> I just need it does not exit It's about three psi in some cases because the safety <coughs> has a, what we call a rupture disc as a safety. Oh, believe that. All right. Yeah. Remember, we it, safeties in here is the spring loaded or the one time safety valves, right? Mm -hmm. With pressure that one, the pressure relief is a rupture disc. It's a, it's a little disc they screw in on the board, and it has a very a paper-thin membrane that as soon as the pressure exceeds 5 psi, it blows. It blows. Because they're, it's, um, it's on the evaporator, right? It's on the high side. It's like this, and you have the disc, <coughs> and it is covered like if you cut a pizza. So it pops right here, and this four pieces come up like open up like a flower. And it shuts off. Well, the system will not shut off until it um, detects a loss of refrigerant. But this now, they used to pipe this outdoor, but this is piped right back into the system. The system, um, it will shut down at high head pressure. And once this blows it, you can't vent it because typically this has a. Um, this will probably. The old system will have R11. You can't vent R11. All right? R11, I remember the days where we used to take R11 and clean truck engines and car engines. Now we got to recover that circuit. Right. And those are one of the few refrigerants you can have it in a bucket. Like you will have fuel, mm. and it's not going. It has a very, very Stable. low evaporating temperature. The evaporating pressure is in vacuum. 
So you have to be in a vacuum environment before it starts evaporating. And before it starts evaporating. Can I flick that back for me a second, please? How many names are you going to come here? Two names? Where were we? Go back. Go back. Go back. No, 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 no. No, we got to go forward. Go forward, yeah. Forward one. There. Right there, right. So now, cascade systems are pretty much, they're not the same as I am, as the uh, one with different cages. Now, what these are is, different complete units all together. That goes from one, you use one unit, state, the first stage would be your final stage here, right? The sec, second stage unit cools the condenser of this final stage unit, and the third stage will cool the condenser of the second stage, and it goes like that. And typically, you probably see like three of them in a in a cascade system. And how these will work, the last stage, they will cool this room to um, whatever temperatures. It's gonna be a room in a room, right? They cool the outer room yeah. to, let's say, 40 degrees, right, or 35 degrees. Then they'll cool the room inside that room so, somewhere maybe negative 50 degrees. Then they have a little machine. The final thing will be a small um, compact uh, case with the final stage of the refrigeration system in the area they put their sample that they want to bring down to the negative 125 or there's above. So that's going to be sitting in a room that's like at negative 50. And that now will just work and whatever condenser get, um, air comes out, this negative 50 degree room will handle. So that's how cascade work. The first stage, the last is this, this compressor pumps into that evaporator, right? I mean that condenser here. And that does its own thing, it has its own evaporator to negative 50, right? Mm -hmm. Then this one evaporator is like this. The red represents the evaporator and it's gonna cool that there. It's a kind of, this would be a tube in tube, all right? So what we we'll have is that whatever discharges here will be on the outside and this This discharge comes right in. Let me get it black. <coughs> Hopefully I have it. The discharge of the compressor is discharging into the suction side of the second compressor. Yes. And this goes to the, this would be the liquid from this compressor that goes to the 
final evaporated air. You're gonna see, I, there is supposed to be a picture of it, better than I'm drawing here anyhow. So, but the, the um, <laughs> condenser of this is cooled by the evaporator of this. And the condenser of this one is cooled by the evaporator of this one. Okay. And end stage, stage one, two, three. That would be a final stage, which is the big walk-in. This one would be the smaller box, and this would be where they put the samples. And this would be like the minus negative 100, negative 125. Finished right then? And what happens to, see this stage here that goes down to negative one something, that would be a totally different refrigerant from this, and it could be a totally different refrigerant from this. I could use 134A here. That would bring me comfortably down into a 35 degree right. range. I could use 404 here, which would bring me comfortably down probably into the negative 50 degree range. And I could use whatever exotic refrigerant, the thousand dollars a pound refrigerant in this final stage. Special, special constructed system, this last stage. All right? Expensive. Very. That's why they, they, they will call any and everybody to do that. No, you have to be a specialist to do that, right? Because I remember um, a funeral parlor had a problem and they couldn't find anybody. And they decide they're going to call me, but I tell them funeral parlors are out to the freaking question for me. No, why? I had a bad experience in one. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. But you saw him move or did he tell you he's in there? No. These guys, there's, there was no sign that this place was a funeral parlor, but they tell me work on it. And I'm up there working on a damn walking box, thinking, it, well, it is walking, you know, it's a cooler. And I have to peek in the next freaking room. Bodies. Yeah, I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> what the? And I was the only one there. <laughs> <laughs> they leave me in a freaking building at six in the afternoon. <laughs> uh, tell me not put the door in when I'm gone. Yeah, I'm like, you sound bad. I, I charge double, but you know. Uh, yeah, double. I remember working in the one in a funeral parlor too, and then the the the, the hearse came in, and they. They unloaded the body and they pushed it into the back of the garage where we were working and they left it right there. And the guy I was with was like, he, he walked outside and he wouldn't, get, wouldn't come in. He's like, as long as that body's there, I'm not coming inside there. I mean, they left it right in the back of the garage. Like, yeah, that's, that's the damn. They're not the problem, it's the limit. So, um, yeah, like I said, our cascade system used one, two, three systems, uh, um, two or three systems. <coughs> to get those different stages. So, what I am, you know, whenever we use these positive displacement compressor, the whole idea is we do not want to go into a vacuum because if you go into a vacuum in any of these compressors, they have a tendency to suck that oil up because it vaporizes the oil pretty fast. All right. And it will suck it up and send it through the system. Your, your compressor will be starving for oil. So you want to um, kind of try not to get that. Yeah. You're not right, are you? Yeah, I will. You finished? Go ahead. No, no. And some of the numbers they probably will shoot that you hear is slightly different, but they concept remains the same regardless of the final temperature. See? And we used to have the third stage of one of these systems in the lab and Someone of the students decide, you know, we're gonna, it's here for us to experiment, for us to break. And they didn't, they didn't try to figure out what, what it was, how it works. They just start hacking it apart. So you see the gross stupidity of mankind. You know, honestly, 
common sense would tell you. But the common sense is not common. Well, let me put it this way, right? Common sense is like common sense is like perfume or deodorant. The people who need it the most <laughs> don't fucking use it. <laughs> That's probably the best thing you said all by. Apart from this, that's what I'm presenting to you. But, you know, that came from the heart, but it, sad to say it is the truest thing in this world. Uh -huh. I gotta agree with you. Yeah. Bro, that dude that I got, that shit right there, oh man, he don't know nothing about the odor and stuff, nothing, bro. I think it's dribbling yesterday, he smells stink as shit. I don't know, oh, bro. Right there, the cashier inside that, that, that shell on there, the corner right there on Johnson. And, uh, oh, the gas station? Yeah. yeah. Bro, he stinks, bro. They gave me change, I'm not fainted, bro. What the fuck is wrong with this guy? But wait, uh, who was sitting in the back there said that's the best thing I said out of mine? Greg. <laughs> no, it wasn't Greg. Right. 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 It was Josh. What up? <laughs> that was a good say, you know, I like that. What did that say? Hold on, they moved to now. Oh, here's what I was attempting to draw, right? Yeah. <laughs> but they have a... Um, and you got all the huh? yeah. see? That's a... You notice the... The suction of um, this one, right? Yeah. Is cooling the discharge of this. So this is the condenser from this stage here, and this evaporator from this stage is cooling, the is cooling this <coughs> condenser here. To separate refrigerant system, there's no way that refrigerant is mixing, by the way. No, you said it's a tube in a tube. It's one tube yeah. bypassing another tube. Right, so there's no way it's going to mix. And this system, you can have a different <coughs> um, Different designs of them, but the whole concept remains the same. And this is just a simple. One system. of them had a glycol and water mixture as a refrigerant. One of the cascade systems we showed us is down to negative 120. That would be the, um, like in the very, yeah, yeah, very yeah, beginning. Yeah. Alright? That'd be the last <coughs> yeah, stage there. All the way over. Yeah. And I tell you what, some people, <coughs> some books, they will call this second stage and that first stage, and some will switch it around. Bottom line is, I would say the one that achieves the lowest temperature would be my third stage. I would think so yeah. too. You know? So first stage cools the second stage, second stage cools the third stage. That's or the final stage. Makes sense. <laughs> now guys, um this, this presentation from this point here until I say otherwise, that's gonna come on your final. Alright, so please, I'm not going to repeat this. And, uh, on Tuesday. Yes, and if, uh, if, uh, if, um, 28. 28. 28. 27 and 28, we did. After the midterm, we did 27 and 28, right? <coughs> and this is 29, right? Is it? 28, right? This is 29. I think. Yeah, the trucks maybe were. Trucks are 28. Yeah, trucks are 28. 26, 27 were the components. The ice 20, machine. The ice, ice machine was... Um, it was 27. So we did 25, 26, 27 was the ice machine, 28 was the trucks, this is 29. Oh, okay. So it's um, 27. Low temperature, extra low temperature systems, cascade systems. So until you say otherwise, it's fine. Yeah, so a lot of this section will be on your final. Plus everything else I talked about before, mm -hmm. they have one or two questions, but quite a bit of those questions will come from this section here. Because these are need to know. 29. 
And there's no way the phone is going to help you in the final because it's not going to be no phone use permitted in the final. Oh, the internet. No, this is still chapter 28. Is it? Yeah. Okay. 29 is what? 29 is uh, troubleshooting and typical operating conditions for commercial refrigeration. Yeah, and that's going to be um, tomorrow. <coughs> we complete that tomorrow, Monday. So this is 28? 28. 28, yeah. So everything up in, until 29. And by the way, everything I'm presenting to you here is on the four is in the four chapters in this small book that we're supposed to cover. So it doesn't really make sense I go over the same thing twice. <coughs> All right. Because whatever was not included in this book I spoke about yet, and if you were listening you could get the more <sighs> you know. Refrigeration is refrigeration guys and no matter who write the book, the principles remain the same, the components remain the same. Application difference. Is it open book? But <laughs> I know. You give him a vote by himself. Just a Just a Just 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 a Just a Just Just <laughs> Quick freeze method, guys. These are for packaging, basically. And um, they, they, with this here, if when you freeze food, the faster you can freeze that food, the better the texture will be, and the better your product will be. Because what happens if you freeze it pretty slow? The water, water droplets form crystals, small crystals, but they have enough time now to come together and bond and form one big solid ice crystal in maybe your vegetable or your meat or what have you. And it kind of tear the whole structure apart. So that when you tie it out, it becomes mushy mm -hmm. and yucky and you, the first thing you think about, food, garbage. <laughs> right? If you freeze it fast enough, the, you maintain the crystalline structure in that the individual crystals stay as small individual crystals. They do not touch, come together and form one big blob and damage the thing. So that allows every individual little pea that they freeze to stay as an individual in the package so that if you spill a pack of green beans on the floor here, it's going to behave like marbles, and if you walk on it, you're going to spill. Mm -hmm. you know? If you did it slowly, maybe one big block. Yeah, if you did it slowly, every t the whole package of peas would be like one stuck thing. together, and you have to put it in water to tie it out yeah. for the next mm -hmm. two days, and when you finish tying it out for two days, it's no good because it's mushy. Yeah. And nobody wants to, uh, you know, if you wanted... Oh, that's when you get a ham bone and you make pea soup. <laughs> <laughs> But if you wanted pea soup, you make it yourself, you know, you don't want frozen pea soup. But you see, the hair maintains the freshness of the food to the, from field to freezer mm -hmm. to the table. To consume so you, know? so you, you want it frozen as fast as possible. So um, each of these are frozen and the way the way they uh, freeze these individual little small items is that they have it on a conveyor and they go through this blast chiller on a spiral conveyor. Now those, every individual piece goes through as an individual piece, it does not touch, they're not touching each other, all right? So when it goes through here, each comes out rock hard. We call that, guys, you probably seen this on um, seafood packages. You probably see this here, I, Q, F, and seafood packages, especially shrimp. It says IQF, individually quick frozen. 
So each of those items come out as one and not as um, a lump. Okay. So you can that allows you if you want to um, cook half the package. Hey, I take a half. The other and put the other half back in the freezer. But then when I put holes. it in my freezer, I pull it out and it's a block. That's because you're probably packing your freezer wrong and your freezer is not performing as it should. Wow. Here's the deal, because when we well, freeze it, it at took, this, right? It took you too long to get home from the store. Yeah. yeah. When we yeah. do that this, the supermarket maintains us at negative 10. You at home is at zero. Uh -huh. This... Whatever it is, no matter that it's at zero, it still holds its structure. The moment you open it, you, in, you have air infiltration and thing. get it back into the freezer type, in an airtight package, and put it at a point where it can get exposed to the air. Now, there are people who go into, when they have their home, see how all these paper are? Yeah. That's how they pack everything in their freezer. They do not need space in between. You need space in between every item so you can, it can breathe. Well, you want the air go wrong and wrong everything. It's like a walk-in. Yes. Yeah, my freezer is so small. When I go shopping, they usually you I gotta pack, pack it out. out. Yeah. No, um, we do when you go shopping. Eat most of the food when you come home, and then just. <laughs> yeah. right. You know. Yeah. You have to eat when you have the food, and when you don't have the food, you can uh, come on, eat. So, no matter I'm at zero in, in the home, your home freezer, everything that was pre-frozen stays frozen. Because your freezer at home is designed to actually maintain, and it is it's not going to maintain negative 40, it's going to maintain zero and hold the structure and anything that's there, even ice cream. Okay? But you have to pack your freezer properly. Make sure there is airflow around it. But your whole freezer is negative 10, though, right? Not necessarily. General range is zero. Zero, okay. okay? Because. Of the residential uh, freezer, okay. Because. Do yourself this favor. Get the temperature pressure chart. If your home freezes at negative 10, that means your refrigerant in there will be boiling at negative 20. Check R134 air pressure that corresponds to negative 20 degrees. You're going to see it's in a practically in the vacuum. They don't, these compressors, nobody allows them to work in a vacuum because they're positive displacement compressor. All right? So there's no way they're going to allow that to happen for you to get this. So they can hold zero without going into a vacuum. Yeah. To get close to zero, you may be uh, somewhere in the region of maybe one pound PSI, one PSI, three PSI. Just a low, very low. Level. Which is very close to being in a vacuum. But it's not. It's not, but yeah. And, um, <coughs> Yeah, check your, and your freezer probably, your, your fridge probably needs cleaning. Oh, condenser new. coil? It's almost brand new. When was the last thing cleaned the condenser coil? You never cleaned it. I touched it, I bought it brand new. How long? Uh, seven years? Four years. No, <laughs> four years. Five and years. you never cleaned the condenser coil? No. It's brand That's what's happening. Because it's probably new. <laughs> no, yeah, anything like two weird. days old is practically old. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure somebody did it. The you get, did you it. get home and go clean your yeah. condenser coil. Yes, get home, clean your condenser coil, and you'll see the difference tomorrow morning. I'm gonna. gonna First thing you do that. today when you get out of here is go clean your condenser coil. Oh, by the way, oh, shit. Uh, by <laughs> the way, do not do like my sister in law did one time. The capillary tube, she was cleaning like heck, and she didn't know how it was, and she banged the capillary tube, broke it off, and everything okay. and was spilling out of it. No. And she was like running out of it. I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, now you're going to kill the fridge. Yeah. You know? But, but, you slash. Your, your branch for hard refrigeration technician, you should be able to correct that problem. Oh, yeah, no, no real problem. 
Good for you. Everything is nice and cold. And the Represent the school. The positive vibes. Or positive vibes. So, um, IQF, in, in order to achieve that individual quick frozen guidance, um, they normally use a <coughs> conveyor system to do that. And the spiral, um, spiral conveyors. Some people call it a rotavator. Some call it a spiral. They have quite a few different names out there. So long as we have the concept, you get it. Now, marine refrigeration. I love this. I love this because I used to make big bucks. We're gonna say big, really big. Same as trucks. These things are supposed to be able to operate because when you're out in the middle of nowhere on the ocean, you can get pretty cold out there. You know, especially as you head north and south. If you're around the equator area, hey, you're happy, all right. But as you head north or go south, you're beginning to get into a lower temperature range. Yeah. Um, Need to work so in the same you need to trucks. do truck, but with now um, everything here is seawater cooled. The condensing unit, nothing is fan cooled here. It's seawater cooled condensing unit. These condensing unit guys, they're special, special constructions. So they're made for seawater application. Um, they're actually made of a metal called cupro nickel. <coughs> Do I have it right? Yeah, it is supposed to be cupro nickel that they made out of. That's highly resistant to seawater and um, salt and the uh, salt and whatever else is in that seawater, you know. And um, it actually works um, like a bacteria inhibitor. It prevents any kind of um, Vegetation from going in the meat exchange itself. Algae. Yeah. There's some property in the metal when that prevents that from happening. It resists rust, it resists. Um, the only thing that actually affects it is um, electrolysis. I'm saying copper has a natural thing, right? That, that's, help, that's good with the water. That yeah, copper. It's natural in the copper, right? Yeah, copper does not rust. Right, it you is. Know that that thing. So it's yeah, it oxidizes and get that patina mm -hmm. on it. Um, but we don't use copper in seawater sea water application. Um, most, of, most of the application there is um, hoses and black iron pipe or galvanized pipe. But never copper, never. I just noticed a word. Yeah, that's, that's what it. it's made of. Cupronicle. That's how it's, it's spelled. Cupronicle. Cupronicle. Typically, we we'll see a hyphen um, right there. But as a material that resists a lot of that seawater effect, and you know. Of course, evaporator needs to be defrosted in it. It's the same refrigeration system as you will find in um, any other place. Now, these condensers, they have what we call a marine box at the end of it that you can remove and get a brush and brush all the tubings in there during the exchange of surface. So, you will, they may ask you what is the difference between a normal con um, shell and tube condenser and a marine type. This one can be cleaned. The audio you have to clean. This can be cleaned manually. The audio you have to clean chemically. Yeah. All right? So, shell in. <coughs> and of course, there is a strainer always where you pull up the seawater. Um, yeah. We don't really put a filter in this. Right. Sure Just a strainer to prevent real, real solid stuff from coming yes. in. You don't want uh, fish getting in there. Yeah, and that's right by the sea cap. Uh, 
So careful how you open that too because you may flood the ship out. <laughs> Just below the water line. Yeah. And these condensers are clean using brushes. refrigerated containers that are transported on these cargo ships. Big ones? Yes. Like, let's say you get in, um, for some reason, this country imports tomatoes from Spain. Like if you don't grow enough here, you know? And that, as soon as it comes out of the field here and they wash it and prep it, they have to put it in a um, refrigerated trailer transport that to the dock, keep it refrigerated. By the way, that's not engine-operated refrigeration. You have to plug it into something, all right? And then they'll load it on the cargo ship, but they have to keep that reefer unit running while it's on the cargo ship. So they have a place they can plug it into. And that typically runs off of the ship's generator. So those trailers with the refrigeration unit, they're designed to be transported by ships, which is a totally different thing from this. This is onboard use. The other is transporting product, produce from one country to the other. Individually refrigerated. Yes. And, um, That's just like a truck <coughs> that they yeah. drove onto the boat. And they yes, and then the when boat. they offload the trailer, the tracker comes, hook up, drive it where it needs to go. With, with, um, now, depends on how far they're going, that reefer unit will hold, or whatever temperature was in that truck, will stay for um, at least 24 hours. Because the truck is not going to be open until it gets to its final destination. Mm -hmm. right. But if not, there is enough power on that truck where we can plug in Turn it on. To continue whatever you did. If it's if you're going far. So, yeah. Normally they pull into the dark courses. Yeah, but, well, you see, here's the deal. If the truck has to transport reefer units, it's going to be equipped to provide power for that unit. Separate than the truck. Because they will have a separate generator size to power that unit. Okay, because they did. Containers now will just be pure refrigeration, compression, com refrigeration system, not an engine with fuel associated with that. Because they do not want to be lifting something with filled with fuel overhead or down from a ship's hold, yeah. you know, and have it on the dock all over the place. Because if that begins to explode, everything else will explode around it. Now, Quick question, and I know I said this two days ago. What type of refrigeration, transport refrigeration, you will associate with an aircraft, aircraft transportation, of frozen or? You said dry ice or? Um, ammonia. No, you said dry ammonia. Well, you can use ammonia. No, no, no. You said dry ice for aircraft. Yeah, dry, dry ice. Dry ice. Yeah, dry ice no or the ice you pack around yeah, the thing, yeah. or yeah, if your stuff is pre-chilled or pre-frozen, mm -hmm. keep your fingers crossed, I hope the aircraft is on time. But it's ice, yeah, the you cannot put, put, they're not going to allow you to put a compressed gas on a aircraft. No. Refrigerant is compressed gas. And refrigerant. Refriger refrigeration system has the potential to cause an explosion. That's why they make noise with the aerosol cans, right? Yes. So, you know, you may not believe this, but if, if you have, let's say, this room, 
if you have dust in this environment, and if conditions are right and you create a spark, like it if you have a that, cigarette. It happens at the feed mills all yeah. the time. If you go light the cigarette and you light, light a spark, it can explode in this room. Blow it to hell up. Yeah. Just the dust in there. What that happens. Dust you're talking about those regular dust? Regular dust, um, from food processing, like grains processing. You get that from food mills and stuff like that? What soy? Like stuff? flour mills? Yep. They have a history of exploding really, really nasty explosions. They have the very first one that happened, they had the the mill below and the office above. Uh, Guess where everybody ended up? Yes. In the funeral parlor with that, I don't like to go to. <laughs> <laughs> In the funeral parlor, you know. Yeah, so since then, <laughs> if you guys, as you guys get exposed to things out there, you'll notice they have some motors, they call them TEFC motors, mm -hmm. totally enclosed and and right. fan pool. And they have explosion, the design motors that they call explosion proof. In that nothing is exposed, none of the electrical connections are exposed so that to the atmosphere because uh, if there is just a little unwanted spark at the wrong time, it's, it can explode. That's what we had you know, to do in the Lincoln Tunnel, change everything to explosion proof boxes, yeah, explosion proof to. phones, explosion proof lights. And I see, it's lights pretty tough right. to have those things explode. Conditions have to be right. For example, if, if I have a gas heat, in this, this room, if the gas concentration is below 5%, it's not going to explode. If it's above 15%, it's not going to explode. But if it's between 5 and 15%, don't not like the secret. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, that's the range within which the possibility of that causing a um, catastrophic accident. explosion, that's the limit. With a five percent concentration to fifteen percent. Because of the oxygen, then? Well, that that mix, that percentage mix, will give you the perfect ratio. Because when you do burners, you will find twenty percent oxygen is what we need. Mm -hmm. You know. So just be careful. Because even this, um, you can have explosion internally in a compressor too if things are right. Especially with a really hot <laughs> compressor. And believe no matter how much you think you release all the pressure out of a compressor, guys, before you put a torch to remove anything off of that, any sweat off any line or brace off any line. Leave at least one part of that compressor access open, either the suction or discharge, whatever you want. Leave a port open yeah, to the atmosphere. Because one time I empty the system and I'm brazen half of it in, and the whole freaking thing fly right up here. I still have my ears, but at that time I was pissed. Not because it hurt, it hurt, right? I was pissed because I should have known better. But I was young, you see, I was young like you guys. And I believe I'm macho, nothing can freaking happen to me. That woke me up. Since then, because you hated the you price of the check best. before you do something. Yeah. So, never take things for granted out there. They can turn back and bite you, and they bite you so bad, you end up in some area you don't want to do. So this wasn't too much anyhow, uh, cascade systems. So there will be a few questions on this. <coughs> All the questions will be mixed anyhow. It's gonna be um, equally divided between all the chapters except for the little book. I'm gonna incorporate that and redesign the questions so it will look like it's coming from this. <coughs> I haven't made up my mind as yet. It's all about it. It just depends on how, what kind of mood I wake up in Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know. right now. See, these days, I can't even have a, I can't even go to happy hour, so I'm totally ticked. <laughs> <laughs> no, too <first. laughs>